Welcome to uh, the second day of the Entheogenesis uh, Psychedelic Lecture Series. We are thrilled to have Bill Linton, Pancho Meisenheimer, and Alex Sherwood of the USANA Institute, who are going to talk to us about the FDA approval process and beyond for psilocybin-assisted therapy. So can we all have a hand? And Okay, Ron, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, what you've done here to help put this together. Um, I'm really just going to make some introductions and some recognitions and then kind of set the stage for you, Sona. Uh, these are some of the guys that are doing the most phenomenal work, particularly on the chemistry, and we have a whole team of people uh, led by uh, Laura McCormick, Melinda Nutzinger, many others who are just doing incredible work uh, back in the home base in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I really want to give an appreciation to uh, David Bronner and his team for what they did and the amount of time uh, that they did it to put this together. The design team, the construction team did an incredible job. Uh, and Andy, I just saw you a second ago. Um, thanks so much for, yeah, there we go. Thanks so much for what you did put together this program. Thank you. Yeah. So we actually have several members of the USONA team here. You've uh, already met uh, Alex uh, Sherwood, uh, one of our uh, chemists, Poncho Meisenheimer, who runs chemistry uh, as well. Uh, Christy Kalo. Christy, I want you to raise your hand. She's one of our chemists as well. There you are. Thank you. Uh, another chemist, we have Robert Cargbo. He's in uh, San Luis Obispo, California, working at the bench as we speak. We like that. Um, and uh, Troy Good, who's a chemist and project manager here in the room as well. Rosmi Kars, research and information coordinator. Rosmi, where are you? Troy, where are you? Ooh, thank you, guys. Thank you. So USONA Institute is a newbie. I mean, we're, we just uh, kind of appeared on the scene about five years ago because what was needed at that point in time was to build on the incredible work that had been done in many institutions, New York University, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, some work that had been done at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And what needed to be done was to put together a team of people with funding to take this through the FDA process. And we're starting with FDA and then moving to the EMA in Europe. Um, in 2014, we just thought, well, how hard could that be? Oh my, oh my, I have to tell you. Um, presently, we have a staff of 20 people, and we're supported by another 45 organizations and individuals throughout the world that are helping us achieve this goal of getting psilocybin approved uh, as a therapeutic process, as a, as a therapy, psilocybin therapy. It's not just the drug, it's the entire therapy that goes along with that that makes that effective. Thank you. Um, so not only does our work rest on the shoulders of people who've been doing this for decades, but I also want to recognize that there are individuals, there are communities, there are tribes that have been working with these plant medicines for thousands of years. Gordon Watson in 1957 published in Life magazine his discovery of what Marina Sabina and the groups in Mexico had been doing for literally thousands of years and brought it to the West. But our work really rests on their discoveries and what they learned and how they practiced uh, for so many uh, millennia. Um, and I also want to say I've got so much gratitude to each of you for being here. We talked, the question was, what can you do? Your presence here is a big step in that direction simply by being here and listening to what we have to say. You can go and you will be a ripple effect in the world by taking the knowledge of what you hear and what you learn and bringing that to your friends, to your families, to your schoolmates, uh, to your coworkers, and talk more about what's coming in the world and it's coming very rapidly. So now we're going to talk about what we do, how we're doing it, and a little bit about why we're doing it. Hey, it's kind of working. It's pretty cool. OK. OK, so of course, all humans have the desire to overcome suffering and to find happiness, Dalai Lama. Uh, there are millions, hundreds of millions of people in the world that suffer from depression and anxiety and all of the diseases that are associated with this. It's the second largest cause of problems and illness uh, that, that are in the world. Um, the treatments that we have that was mentioned in the last talk are simply inadequate uh, to handle 
uh, this disease states, these disease states, with an enormous economic burden. And the burden goes beyond just economies. It goes, touches probably almost everyone in this room in some way, your family, your friends. It causes addiction. It causes many, many other diseases, eating disorders and things of that sort, all have a common root cause in a break in who we are, a break in understanding uh, the nature of who we are and connecting with ourselves. And these medicines can help in that search. So this therapy is really intended to bring a different view of treatment, to get away from the daily regimen of taking antidepressants. And the discoveries that have occurred in the last couple of decades show us clearly that there's an enormous effect when someone takes a single dose of psilocybin, uh, 25 milligrams. Uh, the material is produced synthetically because that's about the only way that the FDA is gonna approve it. We've had to make some compromises in terms of, you know, we all like natural products, we like organic products, we like holistic approaches, but the FDA sees the world in a particular way, and if we're going to make a progress in getting this into our society and into our institutions, we've got to follow the breadcrumbs that they put in place to say, this is what you have to do in order to get approval. Uh, so what is our vision? Um, the molecule psilocybin is known to be safe on a weight basis. It's 200 times safer than aspirin. It's effective as seen in the uh, outcomes of literally hundreds of people. It's something that itself is affordable and uh, USONA Institute uh, has made a commitment to provide this material at no cost to every research institute in the world for at least the next five years. Yeah. And by the way, we can only do it because of the incredible generous support. The government doesn't fund this. This is through the incredible support of people who have stepped up and provided us with funding to make this possible. Um, and I'm looking, one guy right here has really helped. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Uh, and accessibility is a big thing. We're going to be talking a little bit more about accessibility. What a challenge that's going to be. Okay, so the roadmap, where are we and where are we at with respect to today and in the future? So uh, by the end of September, we're going to launch our next major clinical study. It'll be 80 to 100 volunteers, uh, half of whom will get a placebo, niacin, the other half will get uh, 25 milligrams of psilocybin. Um, and it's on the basis of the outcome of that trial that we'll then take on the next step, which we believe will be the next significant step towards approval. And here we're looking at about 2022, 2023, that we hope to have approval uh, in the United States and then also in parallel working to get this approved in Europe for, for uh, treatment there. So a, a couple of um, remarks about USONA itself. First of all, we're nonprofit. This means that we rely on the support of dozens and dozens of people, institutes, and foundations to help us in the studies uh, that are currently underway. Uh, we believe in open science, and this means that when we make a discovery, when we invent something, we publish as quickly as we can and we get this into the domain. This means that we do not reach out and try to patent and own and control through patents. This means that discoveries, and Alex can talk about some of the discoveries we've made, and the early publications on synthesis that have really transformed how even psilocybin itself is made. Um, I mentioned also about the uh, provided the material, and then, uh, oh yeah, and we have lots and lots of people that are helping us uh, in our efforts. And I just want to mention uh, just a few of these. Uh, MAPS is has been an enormous supporter, and uh, Rick, thanks so much for your leadership in uh, providing so much assistance and guidance to our team. Uh, we work with the uh, Beckley Foundation. We work with the Door Research Institute in um, Brazil. Okay. This too shall pass. Uh, Imperial College in England, University of Zurich, I mentioned them, University of Vienna, and these are all significant research institutes that are looking not only at, you know, what these molecules are, but also how they work through brain imaging and beginning to do that very difficult work of even understanding the relationship, again, between structure and outcome. 
Okay, so what have we done? So the FDA has uh, granted us uh, clearance to proceed. We really like that. That took a lot of work. We have something called an investigator's brochure, which is a document that provides guidance on how this, this molecule can be used in research, and we make that available on our website. People can download that at no cost. Um, let's see, we have several, seven clinical trial sites that we now have under contract. Uh, five research uh, universities and two contract organizations that are going to be doing the work. Uh, again, think of 80 to 100 uh, divided by seven, and we hope to have this wrapped up in 12 months. So hopefully next year at this time, we can report back to you that this big study has been completed. That's really our, our goal. Uh, let's see what else is important here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Get this, so we can only sign up 80 to 100, but we have 5,000 people already signed up who want to participate in this trial. I don't think we're gonna have a problem with recruiting. That's really good news. Okay, so what's next? The expanded clinical facility treatment program is something that we have under design. Uh, we also have a number of uh, molecules, novel molecules that we're exploring. The chemists can talk more about that. Uh, and again, we're looking at how do we continue to build on what we've done to this moment, and we're looking at creating a world-class research center, probably based in Madison, Wisconsin, that's gonna continue the clinical research, the design of new molecules, uh, training and education, which is so important. Okay, clinical research, drug development, regulatory affairs, lots of people involved in all of that stuff, and then finally, I wanna mention uh, Chuck Rizon, who's our director of uh, clinical research, uh, and I just want to read what he says. If the large and rigorous studies required by approval by the FDA confirm findings from studies to date, psilocybin will transform how we treat depression, not just in patients who have failed treatments, but in patients who may choose psilocybin therapy early in their disease. So I wanted to read that because the leadership that we have not only has the practical experience, but they have a vision to succeed and they have the will to succeed, and we will succeed with your help. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, so, so I wanna kinda take you through what it's like to create a drug uh, in a commercially sponsored uh, FDA program. Um, even though USONA and, and MAPS are nonprofits, uh, the FDA holds us to a requirement of a commercial sponsor. Uh, and those regulatory requirements are significantly higher for drug development than they are for some of the academic sponsorships that we've had. Uh, and so, so let's kinda go through um, how we kind of go about this. I want to start with a classical drug discovery pipeline, all right? And this is a continuum from left to right. Uh, early on the left side is discovery. Pharmaceutical companies take hundreds of thousands of compounds, maybe millions of compounds, and they screen them in one of two ways. One way may be a phenotypic screen, which means that they're just looking for an effect in an animal or a cell or something. Or another way might be a target-based screen, so they know something about the target they're going for and they just look for a modulator. So they screen in one of those two formats, phenotypic or target-based, and they look for hits. And once they find those hits, they might dial down from hundreds of thousands of molecules to hundreds of molecules. And from there, the chemists start to tweak the molecules a little bit, look for some lead optimization. Think Alexander Shulgin twisting the edges of a phenethylamine or a tryptamine. And then from there, once they get down to a molecule, they've got their lead, and they start down the program of early preclinical safety, clinical safety, phase one, early efficacy in phase two, and pivotal efficacy in phase three. So does anybody have an idea how long, on average, this takes? Just guess out there. 10 years? Yeah, 10, 15, or in our case, greater than 1,000 years. <laughs> So you can see on the left here, we show an early cave laboratory notebook drawing of a large mammal experiment showing that the mushroom is definitely a phenotypic hit for the ineffable. <laughs> so imagine how much material was screened over that period of time. Stuff that didn't work at all, stuff that turned out to be toxic. Um, all sorts of things were happening. But as you kind of head along and you start looking into like Sandoz era when Albert Hoffman uh, actually synthesized psilocybin, 
we actually have a point where we can say, we've got a lead, okay? This is a lead, we're gonna move forward. And from there, we had all sorts of early safety and efficacy uh, uh, trials that went on very early in this research. Uh, but for a number of reasons, we can't use those other than the basis of evidence. We can't use those in our new drug application in the FDA. So USONA basically met with the FDA. Here's some USONA dates. We met with, we met with the FDA in 2017. By mid-2017, we'd established a chemistry laboratory, uh, both in Wisconsin and in San Luis Obispo, California. And then we filed our new drug, uh, I mean, our initial uh, new drug application, uh, investigational new drug application. And by just before 2019, we had our pharmaceutical grade psilocybin. After that, the FDA approved that we could proceed to phase two. Now, this is a little bit different. Uh, why did it take us so long to go from a chemistry lab in mid-2017, almost more than a year, to get pharmaceutical-grade psilocybin? Well, this is because you have to think about the FDA was holding us to this requirement of commercial sponsor where they needed to really understand that we had safety and we had efficacy under control. In other words, they needed to know the drug quality. And drug quality, the FDA, is different than the drug quality to all of us, <laughs> okay? And the FDA, it's hard to explain what drug quality means, and I'm gonna try and just walk you through this. To start with, let me show you what it doesn't mean. Okay. Hang on a second here. Apply a mouth. Um, okay, so on this graph right here, on the vertical axis is eight different batches of psilocybin. Six of them are research batches um, made by people like Dave Nichols, Nick Cozy, uh, Robert Cargo, Alex, a bunch of people have made batches like this. Um, two of these are acceptable as GMP or pharmaceutical grade in a commercially sponsored. On the horizontal axis is purity. And so it's just from zero to 100% pure. And if you look at the red bars, you will notice that whether it's a research batch or a GMP batch, they're all essentially 100% pure. They're all within a tenth of a percent. And so the key to bring out of this, even though the blue bars might be a little bit different, that's just the impurity of water. So some of them had a little more water. All of these would occasion a mystical experience, right? But the FDA, only two of them are acceptable. That's because in the eyes of the FDA, purity does not equal quality, all right? So what equals quality for the FDA? We're gonna back up a little bit on how we make these molecules to kind of get into that. So here's some chemical synthesis. Now, if you didn't take organic chemistry and you don't remember organic chemistry, 30 second review, wherever you see an angle, there's a carbon, and if it's not a carbon, there's some element that's drawn there, an oxygen or a chlorine or nitrogen or something like that. And so we kind of start in the upper left, and we start building on a side chain off this indole ring. We start building off a side chain. You can see where it's yellow is where the bond is forming. And then we get into something that looks like a tryptamine, but it's got these oxygens on it, and we reduce down those oxygens to something that's on the far upper right, which is psilocin, which is the active uh, drug, as, as Alex had mentioned, the active drug for psilocybin. Now, psilocin isn't very stable, so we can't put it in a capsule uh, and sell it uh, or, or give it away. Um, and so then after that, the phosphate is installed and the phosphate has some protecting groups on it. And coincidentally, one of the protecting groups moves over the nitrogen that nobody really planned on, but it happens. And then finally, we use hydrogen to eliminate uh, the, those protecting groups. The reason I throw this up here is because for a good chemist like Alex, uh, or, or Dave Nichols or any others, um, they can work through the, the anomalies of this chemistry. They can work through the fact that psilocin is not stable, that this benzyl uh, compound on the lower left is not stable, that this zwitter ion in the middle bottom is not soluble in pretty much anything. They kind of use those to their advantage and they tease out the psilocybin. The FDA doesn't want that. They don't want talented chemists to be able to make the compound. They want anybody to be able to make the compound, okay? So first thing we did is we kind of redid the synthesis because on the bottom, palladium uh, on carbon, you might see it in there, the FDA hates heavy metals in their drugs. So that one we want to get out of there. Um, all these compounds that are unstable or insoluble, we'd like to get out of there. So we redid the synthesis um, and, and after about six months, found a new synthetic route that eliminated all of those detrimental aspects uh, and made it a shorter synthesis. Also improved the yields by about tenfold, um, so making it significantly less expensive. You people are the first people to hear of this new synthesis and to see it up there, um, and you'll see it published come out in the next quarter or so. So, 
So, what it is about this that gets back to FDA quality? Well, first, um, you know, we're chemists and we like to just sell structures. But the FDA really is, cares much less about the structures. They care about this diagram, which we'll say is the steampunk version of psilocybin synthesis. It's basically a flow diagram of all the unit operations that occur for that last step. Reagents flowing in on the left, doing the reaction, followed by quenching, followed by filtering out solids and retriturating them and going all the way on through to the very end. And at the end, you get a drug. Well, the difference between research grade and GMP grade is this right here. The only control for research grade is you just look at the specifications of that drug. Is it pure enough? If it's pure enough, that's research grade. But to the FDA, quality is the control of the entire process. And so we start looking at other aspects. We control every reagent that goes into this by looking at the analytical um, uh, view of the critical material attributes. We have documented recordings of the, the commissioning of the analytical equipment, the verification that that analytical equipment actually measures these material attributes. In addition, we have another layer of control, all of the engineering controls around each of these reactors, the temperatures, the stir rates, all of that. In addition, we have even more control where we're sipping out material out of each of those unit operations and analyzing them and documenting that analysis along the way. This is what GMP is. The entirety of the control of the whole process. This makes pharmaceutical grade psilocybin. And so in the end, what you have is basically these GMP reactors, and we can do one batch in about six weeks. We can make one kilo or 40,000 doses of psilocybin used for phase two and phase three trials. So next up is just, um, you've seen that, that graph already before. After this, we go into our phase 2B uh, POC for efficacy, uh, and then do a few more clinical trials, you know, renal impairment, food effect. Uh, we do a few non-clinical trials in toxicity around uh, liver enzymes uh, and what are induced and what are inhibited. And then we continue on with a few tweaking on uh, some of the synthesis. And that's what it takes to do the manufacturing of psilocybin for FDA. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm going to change gears a, a little bit here. So, uh, you know, as a, as a drug designer, when I learned that the, you know, contemporary clinical trials with psychedelics were beginning with psilocybin, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, why psilocybin? There, there are so many different psychedelic drugs. Why start with psilocybin? And so as it turns out, there are a, quite a few salient points that, that uh, lead us to, to using psilocybin and, and uh, as a potential... Sure, as a, as a good choice. So as Pancho had mentioned, uh, familiarity, extensive history of safe use. This is a drug that has been in development for thousands of years. So uh, we, we kind of knew what to expect with psilocybin. Uh, the duration, so uh, for five to eight hours for a psilocybin experience, I, while not exactly ideal, and I, I imagine the clinicians could probably comment on this better than I can. Uh, I mean, I think uh, you know, eight hours kind of ties up a whole day, and from a, an efficiency standpoint, this may be a challenge. But it's you know not uh, DOM or something where you know you may be tied up with a patient for 24 hours or more, which uh, you know could could be something of a challenge. Uh, minimal baggage, and basically it's not LSD, so for the, the, the uninitiated, uh, just the, the mere mention of LSD conjures up images of Burning Man and uh, <laughs> whatever else, uh, you know, not, not realities. Uh, and so, it, it, you know, psilocybin, I, I think prior to a few years ago, uh, it wasn't even, a, I don't think people could even pronounce it if they saw the word written on, on paper. I think many people are actually just beginning to learn how to say the word psilocybin. So, so there wasn't really a, a whole lot of baggage attached to this molecule. Uh, and finally, the, the anecdotal and preliminary uh, clinical efficacy. So uh, the anecdotal efficacy has been known for, for some time, and then the preliminary clinical trials have also shown that this uh, may very well be a, a quite effective uh, molecule. Um, so on the right there, also Sandoz uh, had, had made psilocybin uh, in, in, in the 1960s, and so there, there was some clinical use with psilocybin, but that kind of kind of went away in, in the 1970s with the Controlled Substances Act, but it is a molecule that, that we're, we're quite familiar with. But uh, what about everything else? 
So I, I just made this slide from memory. This is uh, you know, maybe, maybe 20 or 30 structures, but if you, if you scan through PCAL and TCAL, there are literally hundreds of known psychedelic molecules. So, so what about all of the others? Uh, so, so yeah, the, the research arm of the USONA Institute, we've, we've set one of our, our key goals is, is advancing scientific understanding into the mechanism of action of these different psychedelic compounds and ultimately to, towards the end goal of accelerating the development of, of new therapeutics. So, you know, just figuring out how they work is, is not enough because, well, you know, wh why are we doing this? And, and it's, it's to try to, to address and help it, the, as many people as possible. Uh, so I'm not going to get in too far into detail in here, but uh, the, the gist of this is that there is a lot that we don't know. So on the left side here, this is kind of the contemporary understanding of how psychedelics works. This is basically what 99% of pharmacologists would agree on with psychedelic drugs. So that's the 5-HT2A receptor. So this is the protein on the surface of a neuron in the brain. Uh, your psychedelic drug, it makes it to the brain. It binds to that, that receptor. Uh, it, it causes a pathway to get activated inside the cell. This causes a bundle of neurons to start firing and, and you get psychedelic effects. Uh, and while this is a perfectly valid explanation of a part of the process, it is very likely much more complex than that. So on the right side, so this is kind of a new paradigm in pharmacology called network pharmacology. So all psychedelic drugs not only bind to 5-HT2A receptors, but they're, they're promiscuous, quote unquote. Uh, they, they like to interact with all sorts of, of different receptors at the same time. And different psychedelic drugs have different interactions with all of these receptors. And so they interact with them at the same time. And so you end up with a, a map kind of, you know, all of these receptors being activated at the same time, then interact with one another. And so there's this, this kind of complex thumbprint for different psychedelic drugs that we, we really don't have an understanding of the, the mechanism of how, how this all works. And uh, I mean, this is largely because we, we just don't have the capacity to study this. I think uh, with modern high throughput pharmacology techniques and, uh, and, and computers and, and machine learning, uh, we are at the point now where we can begin to piece together these, these complex interactions and, and get a better understanding as to how these things are different. Uh, and so I call these the, the black boxes in psychedelic research. So all of this research, uh, you know, it exists on sort of a continuum. You could probably lump all of the scientific research into psychedelics into one of these four boxes. So I kind of live down here on the, the left side on the receptor or molecular end. I'm making molecules and trying to figure out how they, they interact with receptors. You got the systems biology. So, so how do these things affect the brain as a whole, how it works? Subjective experience. So you've got your, your psychologist. And then finally, the, the therapist. And so on the one end, you've got sort of reductionism. So that's you know, saying that you know, we can understand the whole by looking at each of the individual pieces, you know, kind of like a lock you, or a watch. You can, you can take all the gears and springs and put them all together and figure out how the watch works. But then at the other end is, is, a, is a more holistic view. And that says that we, this too shall pass. <laughs> That says that, that we really can't understand the whole by looking at all of the individual pieces. And that's what's so interesting about psychedelic drugs. It's not like a beta blocker or something, you know, this drug that interacts with a certain receptor and it causes your heart rate to go down. It's a very easy system to study. That's why we have very excellent beta blocker drugs. Psychedelics, the, your, the self, the, the consciousness acts on the drug just as much as the drug acts on the person. And the one, like, like I said earlier, this is a, a, a new paradigm in how we actually look at the development of drugs that, that affect the mind. Uh, Y'all know this guy? Who, who's that guy on the left there? Uh, that's Sasha Shulgin. Uh, so, so Shulgin, I, I've been going with experimental psychopharmacologist uh, for, for, for his, his official title. For, for those that don't know, uh, Sasha Shulgin, he was, he was a trained as, as a biochemist. He was a very excellent chemist. Uh, uh, he, he took mescaline once and, and, and found that to be quite interesting and decided, well, mescaline has this structure. What if I move this methoxy group over here and, and then take that compound and see, see how that compares to mescaline and then repeat that uh, several hundred times and, and you have PCAL and TCAL and, and this, is, this is Shulgin's legacy. <laughs> Uh, and so when we were, were building our, our, our research laboratories in Madison, we, we were really, uh, you know, kind of interested in, in, in applying the, the pioneering aspect of, of Shulgin's work, but also fitting that into the, oops, uh, the, the, the modern, modern paradigms that, that will allow us to actually 
reach as many people as possible in a in, in a more formalized way. So uh, you know, Shulkin's motto was was make them and taste them, and I, I can't I can't I can't advocate that here. Uh, like uh, you know, as in bowling, there are rules, and so. Uh, you know, while Shulgin recognized the value of this so-called clinical approach, I mean, he, he basically said that, you know, you really can't understand psychedelic drugs without taking them. Uh, you, you, you can't just, just do that today, so, but you can in a way. Uh, so uh, what, what do we have that, that Shulgin didn't have? So as Pancho noted, we have the ability to produce high quality compounds under GMP. So, so compounds with good purity and quality. Uh, we have toxicology assays. So you know what Chilgin's approach to toxicology was? He'd make a new compound and then he'd take a little bit of it. And then he'd take a little more. And if he started to feel bad, he wouldn't take any more. <laughs> and once again, I can't advocate that approach. So we have assays now where you can, you can get just sort of sort of red flags. So, so you, you basically treat a, a cell culture with a, a molecule and it'll let you know this is probably going to be toxic. It shouldn't be consumed by anyone. Um, so we have high throughput pharmacology assays, computational uh, methods. Uh, we've got all sorts of um, animal behavioral techniques. And finally, we, I think we're moving into an era of favorable scientific, social, and, and, and legal climate. Um, so let's see, where are we going from here? And so this is a, a molecule uh, beyond psilocybin that we're, we're taking through that process now. So uh, uh, <laughs> some of you may be familiar with, with 5-MeO-DMT here. So uh, the picture on the bottom left there, so that's a, a recently synthesized uh, engineering batch of 5-methoxy-DMT. That's about 60 grams of high purity 5-methoxy-DMT. Uh, we've uh, officially filed our uh, IND application with the FDA for 5-methoxy-DMT, uh, and uh, the actual GMP synthesis of this compound is commencing in, uh, in the coming weeks, actually. So uh, the uh, first stages for uh, the first human clinical trials, uh, controlled clinical trials with 5-methoxy-DMT, are underway. So. And so this is just, this is the, as Bill had mentioned, we're, we're, we're a very new entity here. This is just the beginning. Uh, as I see it as, you know, USONA is, is kind, of a, kind of a hub in this wheel. We're, we're currently uh, systematically synthesizing and, and cataloging all of the, the known psychedelics that exist and providing them to, to, to world-class researchers all around the planet, uh, engaging in all of, of these activities in science in such a way that really begins to fill in those black boxes on that continuum. It's, it's joining those two ends of that continuum in, a, in an interdisciplinary and collaborative way so that we can begin to understand the mechanism of action of psychedelic drugs. And so, with that, oops, so many molecules, the time is now. Thank you. I think we have time for yeah, we, questions. Yeah, we have some time for questions, is that right? A few minutes, good. Talk about that a bit. Yeah, let's repeat the question. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, for some of you who have had the experience with 5-MeO, you probably like take the toad or the synthetic, you throw it in a crack pot, a crack, a crack pot, a crack pipe. <laughs> I might go in a crack pot too. Um, and uh, you know, the FDA is not going to be real keen on that kind of uh, route of administration. So we looked at a lot of different things: intranasal. We looked at sublingual. You know, it is not orally active. It gets broken down in the gut. And so we've kind of uh, looked at um, intramuscular injection, and we've looked at that as probably the most safe and effective and precise way of delivering. And we've begun to bracket now the uh, kind of the therapeutic amounts, and then we're going to pursue that really over the next year, uh, ultimately in humans. So that's kind of our direction with respect to a route of administration.
It depends on, on the, the licensing of your, your laboratory. So, so typically, uh, you, in, in whichever country you're working in, uh, it needs to, you need to obviously hold the, the licensing required to receive those compounds. Uh, our laboratory is licensed with the Drug Enforcement Agency, and so there's a, there's a, a process by which uh, you can do this. And, and so it's, it's just a matter of, uh, of following the rules, like bowling. If you go to the USANA website, uh, there actually is some instruction on who to contact, and then there's, a, uh, there's some forms to fill out, and basically we just have to uh, qualify the research center, and then we make these compounds available. The indication, that's the big multi-million dollar question. You know, what is going to be the indication? There, so there's several that have uh, been suggested, but we think that there's a lot more work yet to do over the next probably 12 to 18 months to arrive at what we think is going to be the best initial indication with the FDA. So that's still kind of under investigation. Yeah, and I would add to that, so, so the, the phase one clinical trial is, is really just with healthy volunteers, and that's to collect blood samples, to look at pharmacokinetics, so how does a molecule break down, what's the dose range that's appropriate, so you, you really aren't looking at clinical indications this early in the game. So no one has ever done this with 5-MeO-DMT, uh, and, and so it's, it's really at the very early stages, uh, you know, before you can really even start looking at, at clinical indications. Yeah, and I, I just want to add something, because there have been several questions about the 5-MeO, and, you know, the big question is, why that molecule? And there are two things that really have occurred to us as we've explored different molecules. Number one is the duration of action. Instead of a four to six hour psilocybin experience, it's probably more like a 30 to 60 minute experience. Of, so from the standpoint of you still need the support, you need the pre-work with the individual, you need the, uh, the integration work afterwards, but the experience itself is going to be uh, much more shortened. Uh, that was kind of the one thing. We think it's got a large safety profile as well. There was a second thing I can't remember. Anyway, probably loss of memory. I don't know. <laughs> no. So uh, how, how do we ensure that, that there are people of color included in the, the clinical trials with psilocybin? Or... So uh, yeah, yeah, of the 5,000 uh, people that we have signed up, there's a whole system as far as you know, how to select. Uh, it, part of it depends on geographical proximity. We have two major clinical centers set up uh, in the middle of Chicago, in the middle of Miami, and so we think that's going to be very helpful in terms of selection. Obviously, what's really important is that we have people that can do this, that they uh, exhibit the, uh, the diagnosis of major depressive disorder in the case of psilocybin, and that we are as inclusive uh, as we possibly can be. The, the big challenge for us is how do we make this as inclusive and as available to the literally millions of people that need it. And so there's a lot of work now going on to look at medical uh, systems. And uh, you know the, the paradigm, as was mentioned earlier in the last talk, you know, we need to change our way of thinking about how we provide these treatments uh, to people to make them available as broadly and as deeply as possible and specifically to the people that often can afford treatments the least and who are most uh, at risk in terms of uh, these disease states. Um, I did think of the second point about uh, the, the 5-MEO, and that's that um, it goes beyond, uh, it's not a true psychedelic, and it kind of a term that we've used has been more of a transcendelic, that it reveals the transcendent state and not simply the mind state. And we think this is such a powerful uh, molecule with respect to potential treatment uh, that it can take where psilocybin is going and even take it to a point beyond that.
Yeah, we were trying to use the palladium and carbon as a catalyst uh, in the hydrogenation. Of, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a really good point, um, and, and I'll, so the, the it's, it's a technical question, but just the, it's, a, it's one that's actually reasonable to everybody because one, the question was is why would the FDA have a problem with palladium on carbon in a hydrogenation reaction? And the reason is very specific. The equipment used to do that hydrogenation is very difficult to verify that you have cleaned it from the last time you used it to the next time you use it. So even though the reactions work, the FDA is about the quality and verification of the pre-cleanings and the post-cleanings and all of that stuff. So. At the fact that it was at the very last stage in the synthesis also compounded that difficulty. So if the palladium reaction was earlier in the synthesis, it would actually make it a little, little less of a problem. I was going to mention, this is not kitchen chemistry in case anybody's getting a lot of ideas. I saw a few, I saw a few cameras up there, but hey, good luck. Uh, please. <laughs> The question was is how would the, the recent changes in the law or, or decriminalization of psilocybin or of mushrooms, I should say, uh, in Denver affect our research? And the answer is it wouldn't affect our research at all. Um, the, what we have to do is in the eyes of the federal government and that didn't impact them at all. I couldn't hear that last one. Yeah, like I can't say people wanted it. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're okay on time. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about the like the teleology of since you guys are essentially the starting point of uh, manufacturing a lot of these compounds. Uh, like a lot of these talks are within the framing of medicine, within the framing of healing. Uh, whereas you know some of it, like Michael Paul talked about in How to Change Your Mind, like the betterment of well people, like that dichotomy of healing versus I rephrase the question. Um, so, uh, I mean, we're, we're not there yet. I, that, that's that's the thing. Is is we're at, we're at the the genesis of even asking that question. Uh, you know, I mean, psychedelics have been neglected for the last thirty years. I think we'd probably know a little more if people hadn't been so afraid to work with them for the last forty years. Uh, and so, you know, the, the question that you asked, you know, how do we design a molecule to make well people better or to have certain therapeutic benefits is we don't know how to do that yet. I mean, we're, we're still stuck on, you know, the 5-HT2A receptor. That, that's, that's where they go. Uh, and and it, the, the picture is so much more complex than that. I mean, it's a, it's a known unknown uh, is what it is. And so uh, we, we, we know that we don't know how to do that yet. And so, and so that's kind of the, the goal of our research program is to begin to, to fill in those little pieces so that we do know how to design molecules that can be most effective. So yeah, great question. Maybe back there. Oh. Yeah, that was actually you, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, so the question I think is, I'm, I'm going to see if I can rephrase this, is, you know, so we're going to be uh, a, a supplier and for some time possibly one of the, and probably the one of the major suppliers. And there's something called REMS, which is Risk Evaluation and Management, uh, which means that we have to design a system to make sure that wherever this is supplied and whoever receives this does this in a very safe and effective way. We have a responsibility as the drug sponsor to ensure that this, which is a generic, I mean psilocybin is a generic, to make sure that it's delivered in a very safe and effective way. And we have that responsibility and we take that very seriously. So that's, that's really up to us to make sure that that happens. And to monitor uh, every event that may show any kind of a, a, a risk or any kind of a safety problem. Yeah, so we'll probably hold off that decision uh, until after the, uh, the POC for phase 2B. Um, right now, uh, the flowability of our material is good enough that we could actually just use it neat. Uh, we don't need to add any cellulose or magnesium stearate or any other caking or flowable reagents. Um, but we'll see. For, for the finished product, that may change. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, with the ready, ready availability, let's say, of mushrooms, which is really very inexpensive, uh, obviously that is not going to be FDA approved and it's not going to be something that, as a drug sponsor, that we can undertake. Uh, the cost probably in a final delivery of psilocybin, when we look at the scale and so forth, is probably $25. Okay, when you compare a single treatment with that kind of an outcome, and again, that's just, I'm throwing out numbers here, uh, maybe it's $30, but when you compare that with the total cost of treatment, the therapy, the time it takes to evaluate people, to screen them and so forth, this is a tiny, tiny small amount of what the cost of the treatment is. And so the, the hurdle to making this available is not the, the material itself. And even going through the full drug product encapsulation distribution, maybe it's, $37.50, but the point is that's not ever going to be the major problem in getting this available. It's going to be, you know, the, the full uh, package of therapy, and it's not a psychotherapy per se, but it is ensuring that this is done. Set and setting is absolutely paramount as people who have been in this field and understand so well. Yeah, I mean, every, everybody, uh, the question was, is does the cost uh, uh, for the drug actually get burdened significantly by all the regulatory events like DEA? And, and definitely DEA has their annual fees uh, for each of the different licenses that we have. Um, it, it's, it's not hugely significant uh, compared to just time on research. Uh, time on research is probably the most significant aspect of, of, of most of the costs. Yeah, the, the question was, is, is there a contraindication with the current uh, SSRIs or other uh, depression treatments? And since none of us are clinicians, I don't, I don't know that we are in a position to actually answer that question. But uh. yeah, actually, I can, 
Yeah, so in our current study, uh, many of the people coming in will have been on antidepressants. And in our study, they have to have been kind of washed out or they have to be free of that. And that's a risk as well, because you have to take somebody then off that. But we need to see how it works in the absence of the antidepressants. And so, again, that's a part of the complexity of doing this kind of a study. Um, in the future, that will be an important study to do by itself. That is, then can somebody stay on an SSRI and still effectively be treated by psilocybin? But at this particular clinical trial, we want to make sure that that's washed out of a person's system. Uh, last question. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, so the big question is, you know, what does this look like in five to ten years, you know, given, and, and first of all, there was, it was not IM injection of psilocin or something, it, this, we were only talking about one potential route of administration with 5-MeO, because again, it's not orally active. But look at this as the small end of a big funnel, that there's so much here that we do not know, like ultimately, what is approval, what is approval going to lead to, uh, off-label indications, how this gets eventually filtered in and through and into society. And so lots and lots of good questions. And keep the questions coming, keep that curiosity going, because that's the only way we're going to understand you know, what the potential answers are to these things. And hopefully year by year, as we come back here, invited by David Bronner and his team and others, that we'll have more answers to these questions. But we need these questions asked. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Pancho. Thank you, Alex. We're going to have our next uh, speaker starting in about five minutes. So if you're going to stay, stay. If you're going to leave, leave. And the USONA folks will be outside to answer your questions right after the speech.